So one of Macmillan's uh, area studies councils is the European Studies Council. It's one of our biggest, our most active uh, councils. And uh, the director of, uh, the, of that council, the council chair is Professor Aditya uh, Boyanowska, uh, who's here to introduce our guest today. And within the European Studies uh, Council, we have a very active Baltic Studies uh, program that we're really uh, especially proud of. Uh, that, that we'll hear a little bit more about. So Professor Balinaska's own research uh, is in 19th century Russian literature and intellectual history, empire and nation in Russian culture, the history of globalization and central European literatures. And she is a publishing powerhouse. Her recent book is uh, A World of Empires, The Russian Voyage of the Frigate Plata, which received uh, many awards, uh, including a Best Book and Literary Scholarship Award and the Gus Ranis uh, International Book Prize from Macmillan. Um, she received a very prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship in 2020 to explore imperial themes in the work of uh, major 19th century Russian writers. So I could go on a lot about uh, Professor Boyanowska, but she doesn't want me to. So <laughs> I will just stop now and let, uh, let Edita uh, introduce uh, today's guest. Thank you so much, Stephen, and welcome everyone. Um, uh, I guess I don't need to introduce myself anymore. Uh, so thank you so much for this generous introduction. Uh, but before I introduce our guest, um, again, I want to reiterate that this uh, event is, has been organized or co-organized by the Baltic Studies Program, which is part of the European Studies Council. And Professor Bradley Woodworth, who directs the program, uh, could not be here today. So I jumped at the opportunity to do the honors. Um, we are thrilled uh, to welcome um, as our speaker this morning, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, Gabrielius Landsbergis. Uh, he stepped into this very prominent role in December of 2020 after serving for four years as a member of the SEMAS, which is uh, the Lithuanian parliament. For two years prior, starting at the early age of 32, Minister Landsbergis was a member of the European parliament. And after Russia annexed Crimea and launched uh, a war, the war in Donbass in 2014, Minister Landsbergis, not minister yet, um, authored a comprehensive and let me say excellent report on the state of EU-Russia relations. And in fact, were more of its policy recommendations implemented back then, uh, Europe's and uh, Ukraine's situation would be very different today. Minister Landsbergis holds a master's degree in political science from Vilnius University. He's also a chairman of the Homeland Union, a Lithuanian center-right party of Christian Democrats. He comes from a family of venerable political lineage. He is the grandson of Vitautas Landsbergis, uh, the first head of state after Lithuania restituted independence in 1990, following 50 years of Soviet occupation. Vitautas Landsbergis, the grandfather, was awarded uh, the honorary Yale doctorate in 1990. So Yale, the Yale connections with the distinguished Landsbergis family uh, go way back. It is an incredible honor to welcome Minister Landsbergis today he will first offer brief remarks on the topic of the future of transatlantic relations and the global implications of the war in Ukraine. Uh, we will then open the floor to your questions. Uh, so that is roughly the order for today. Thank you so much for joining us today, Minister, and welcome. Thank you. If it's, if it's okay, I figured that uh, we could have this as a more uh, eye level conversation, if it works. Uh, I'm truly greatly uh, honored for uh, you offering this, this opportunity to, to talk. Um, one of the things that um, we tend to mention uh, these days, especially after the 24th of February, is that uh, uh, nobody would um, uh, recommend to their friend living in um, historic times. Unfortunately, this is what uh, exactly is happening. And uh, not only we're living in um, historic times, but also, you know, I'm coming from 
uh, region which um, tends to feel a tiny bit of that history happening around us. So therefore, I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting and important to share uh, our perceptions and, and our uh, situation analysis, so to say. So the, the main point that I would like to, to start with, and I don't want to, to drag too long to give you more time for, for questions, is um, uh, one of the notions that we feel very strongly in the Baltics and especially in Lithuania, after the war, uh, after, war after the war broke out, uh, and as uh, Madame Meditam um, mentioned, um, the saying was that the Baltics were right. Um, so many people in the media, in politics, in, uh, in universities, academia, broader, uh, would come over and in a number of formats would say, you guys, you were right. We admit it. The last person to tell that was um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who just recently made her um, uh, State of the Union address. Uh, it's like five or six days ago. And this is what exactly, this was exactly the phrase that she used. We should have listened to the Baltics more because they were right. And um, apart from being um, a nice thing to hear for a politician, for a Lithuanian, for a member of family who has been in politics for quite a while, um, it gives you, an, you know, kind of, it starts your thinking. So what, why did we have it right? What makes us right? And, and how to keep on affecting the policies of other countries when you have a possibility to be right. And uh, so first of all, obviously it goes without saying that we're the country uh, that broke away very recently when you think about historic times. Three decades, it's a very brief period for a country to forget where we were. Uh, we have a, a generation of, politicians who spend a big part of their life in occupied country. Now we have a, a new generation of, of, of politicians who remember very well what it meant to break, break free. So it still affects us when we see tanks rolling in uh, Ukrainian fields, especially Russian tanks. Uh, we remember the sites. We remember the view because that's in most, in many cases, is the same tanks that uh, that were stationed in in Lithuania and in other Baltic countries. Um, we knew what it is to be in part of colonial empire, one of the last one remaining colonial empires, and when it started breaking apart, uh, we knew very well that it did not break completely. That the spirit of the empire was. Uh, remaining. It remained there. Uh, it was very clear for us in 1990, 1999 uh, in, uh, in Chechnya, in 2008 in Georgia, and then 2014 in Ukraine. That is the same empire as trying to rebuild itself. And you can call it whatever you want, Soviet Union 2.0 or Peter's empire or Catherine the Great's empire, whichever name suits you best, but it, or, or yes, or all the above, uh, that is trying to recreate itself. So we had this understanding, and therefore, most probably we heard this remark that we were right. But still the question remains, so what can we do about it? Because for me, being in this position, especially now, feels that this um, recognition was a very brief one. And now we're in a situation where, again, we start seeing where the Baltic countries, Poland, uh, other countries in the eastern, eastern flank of, of NATO, uh, which borders uh, Russia or Belarus, where we're saying things, but not necessarily those things affect uh, politics of our partners and allies in Europe or NATO. So apart from being right, you have to continue being right, but you have to be effective in persuading others that you're right. So this is where we are now. This is what I'm going to do this week in, uh, in New York, in Anga, trying to convince uh, certain things. And we need to 
And most, I mean, I would, I would just leave with, with one thing. That the main thing that we are saying now, what the message that you would hear from the Baltics, is that um, it already sounds like a cliche, but it's not. That is our war. It's not a, uh, just Russia's war against, against Ukraine. It's against everybody else who depends on rules-based uh, order in, in the world. Because if that order breaks in Ukraine, it will start breaking out everywhere. Therefore, you know, the question of, uh, of Taiwan is so important in this, in this regard as well. Uh, but it's also the question that uh, very important to Lithuania, that we feel that we would be next. Therefore, we have to win this war. We have to do everything in our collective power as a collective West to win this war, because this war, it's not just about Ukraine. It's about Lithuania, it's about the Baltics, it's about Poland, it's about everybody globally who depends uh, not on the might of their army, uh, but on their belief uh, that they're guarded by uh, a set of rules and obligations and a determination to be free in a democratic society. So that would be all for me to start with. Thank you so much for these opening remarks. I have to say you zoomed into the, the question that I had in my mind already, but uh, maybe let's open the floor to the questions from our audience. And uh, Christina, I know that you will monitor the questions that come in. Uh, Actually, Maximus. Maximus please. will. Okay, perfect. And I will be passing. Excellent. Okay. Questions? Comments? Thank you, Mr. Minister, for coming here. Uh, my name is Viktor Babinski. I am a Polish graduate student in history, and I'm writing a dissertation about NATO expansion. So uh, what you're saying about the delusions that the West had and, and the fact that we, as a collective new eastern flank of NATO, were right, pointing out uh, the misconceptions in the approach to Russia really strikes a tone with me. I want to zoom in on, on the energy side of this, because for at least two decades, uh, we were pointing out the risk and stupidity of, of increasing Western Europe's reliance on Russia. Uh, and while Poland and, and Lithuania were increasing its energy independence, building energy terminals and new pipelines to Norway, Germany was closing its uh, atomic plants and, and building Nord Stream 1 and 2. Now, it seems like right now, that policy has been fatally exposed as, as, as wrong. The question is, how do we go about building a new, more, more reliable strategy? Can, can we trans how can we transform this admission of failure into a more responsible energy policy for Europe? How can Central Europe, Lithuania, Poland lead this? Thank you. Well, I think that there's, uh, uh, there are two parts in this. When we're specifically talking about, about energy, yes, you're right. Uh, I think that the policy, the previous policy is completely exposed as, as a you know, failed one. Um, that the trade, be it in energy trade, does not change or force other countries to, uh, uh, to adapt to more rules-based uh, uh, order, so to say. That the notion was that if we trade with the, you know, the non-democratic countries by time, you know, because they will be dependent on the contracts from the West, they will change. Um, that in turn will create a, um, a society there that would demand not just the money that is coming from, from the West, but also other things, you know. While buying iPhone, you will need some small part of democracy as well. And you know, this is how we'll influence, influence the autocrats, uh, autocratic societies everywhere. But the problem was that somehow it completely did not work. It created leverage on the Western societies where the dependency was so strong that basically we started overlooking the cases of corruption, uh, bribing, political corruption, and all these things that basically uh, the, 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 the change was happening not on the autocratic side, but on the democratic side. But basically we started getting corrupted, but on the broader scale. Uh, so, so this is, and again, as you, as you mentioned, this is not co 
absolutely not a surprise uh, for us. We've seen that happening. So our transition to um, uh, from Russian uh, um, provided energy sources started in 2008, when Lithuania was dependent on one uh, gas pipeline to Russia, and we were paying the back then the highest price in Europe, which was absolutely politically motivated uh, to, to pay that. And this is when we started building LNG uh, LNG terminal. And if not for the global prices that are extremely high everywhere now, we would be paying uh, probably one of the lowest prices in, in, in Europe. But that brings me to the another point that basically all what we have to prove now that it's all dependabilities on non-democratic countries are makes us vulnerable. And it goes beyond energy. And we're seeing that with, with supply chains uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to PRC and uh, basically Everything that we depend on countries which are non-democratic makes us more vulnerable. And that has to be a, a certain a, a bottom line for, for, for us. And I'm glad that um, the countries are awakening to this. Uh, European Commission is awakening to this. Uh, the, there was a report just um, presented, I think, yesterday by the European Commission when it comes to the securing of uh, supply, supply chains. So basically, this is this is the, the, the awakening. And my last point is that. Um, it's not just dependabilities. There's an excellent book uh, recently released by um, Mr. Galliotti, uh, Weaponization of Everything. Um, so <clears throat> it, it brings a very simple point that basically we have to make an audit of basically everything that connects us to a um, aggressive non-democratic countries. And we have to start thinking that it can be weaponized. And it probably, most probably, if it can, most probably it will. And the strategies are very different when it comes to energy, when it comes to supply chains, when it comes to different uh, different factors. But it will be used against uh, against democratic societies, or already is. So this is again a broader spectrum, new reality that we are awakening in. Thank you very much. We have two more questions queued up. One here, a second here. I'm going to cue myself in, and then number four. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Um, we've seen the Russian economy largely, well, not fully recover, but have an uptick since its lows in March of 2022. What do you believe the next steps for sanctions are? Do you believe sanctions are the answer? Um, and what do you think, like, personally should be done to punish Russia for the invasion? I think that it's what we're seeing is, a, is quite uh, easily explainable phenomenon. Probably that could be the word. Uh, it's a new one. Uh, but the hike in energy prices that we've seen after the war uh, helped Russia to compensate for some of the financial losses uh, that occurred from, uh, from the sanctions. Uh, so that happened. But I, I have to agree with those who are saying that sanctions is a, is a long-term strategy. That means that... Uh, Technological, especially technological sanctions that are imposed on Russia, uh, will hamper its economy, medium to long term. Uh, and in order to compensate for them, they are using way, way more uh, money that they are getting from from the energy resources that they are getting now. Um, and then what we're seeing, just give you, I, I can give you an example of of uh, of Lithuania. We need roughly, at the very minimum, two to three years to expedite our uh, green transition. You know, we were planning it to have five to seven, 10 year strategy. Now we're speeding it up two, three, five years. And it's not just Lithuania. Basically in Europe, in European continent, I would say almost every country has sped up its uh, transition strategy. So what we will be seeing in the next two years, there will be a boom in wind, solar, in uh, hydrogen, all these technologies that work seen for 2030 and after that, it will be happening now. That means that this source of money that Russia is relying on now to compensate for the losses elsewhere is a very, well, you could call it midterm, mid, mid, mid range, two to five years, but basically it will be running, running out. So the country will be isolated, even with the sanctions that they have now in, uh, in two to five years, I would say. Good morning, Minister, and it's a pleasure to talk to you. And I would like to 
uh, ask you to make an effort to pro project yourself further in the future, because we are at Yale in the end, and talking about the war is interesting, but maybe it's more interesting if we try to project a scenario in front of us. Let me explain what I mean. Russia is big. Russia is a nuclear power. Russia will not disappear. I have to say immediately that what I heard from you, I have been saying for so many years within the European Commission, unheard by many. So I do understand exactly where you're coming from with respect, for example, the invasion of Georgia or the invasion of Crimea or what happened with, on, on the Belarus, Belarus border with your own country last year. Very significant facts that have been for too long time overlooked. But still, Russia will remain our neighbor and an extremely important actor within Europe, within the European continent. There is a concept of 1975 Conference on Peace and Security in Europe, the famous Helsinki Conference, that refers to the indivisibility of Europe security. Interestingly enough, Putin has used this sentence twice, at least to, the, to my recollection, maybe more, but certainly twice publicly after the invasion. What do you think that concept would mean in one, two years time when the war is over for Europe and the European democracies? What kind of indivisibility of security for the continent having to deal with this black bear at our borders? Thank you. Well, you know, one of the questions that, that was being posed throughout the last half a year was whether we can see Russia as part of uh, European uh, security architecture after the war. And um, honestly, I don't see that happening. Um, I think that with, uh, with this regime, uh, or and especially the regime, so that means that it could be another person than the current president. Um, I think that the country will remain a dangerous, uh, and danger and and uh, export a dangerous uh, a danger exporting uh, country in in the continent. So, from our perspective, from Baltic perspective, from the country that is bordering uh, Belarus, which more or less currently is, is a platform for for uh, Russian army. Um, I would say that we are looking into uh, containment. Not a, a, an agreement, but a containment. The indivisibility is broken. It is broken. We, uh, Russia is waging war in expense of European security. So even if the war is, is won or after the, the war is won, I don't think that it's possible to uh, to get back to it because the the premise is still there. Um, so I would believe that if looking to the future, and I know that sounds now a bit futuristic, and uh, but I'm telling you this is this is the mindset of of the countries bordering, is that we have to wait until the regime change, and this is where the content can be. Have, can talk about the indivisibility of security. Again, it might take time. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to cycle myself in, and then we have a few other questions already queued up. Um, both you and your government um, um, espouse what's called the value-driven foreign policy. And I, but I think when people hear value-driven, uh, they actually hear expensive. So, um, are, there, uh, are there some sensible, smart ways to implement aspects of a value-driven foreign policy that you would recommend, that you can think of? And also, um, um, could you give us a sneak preview of um, how you propose to uh, advise your European um, colleagues uh, about how they can sell 
um, this policy to their own constituencies, and especially uh, the idea that um, we need to wean our dependence on non-democratic regimes because that really is, and the current, the idea that the current, it harms us all and the current war is really war against a rule-based order. How do you sell that argument in the case of huge energy prices, skyrocketing inflation and all of that? Thank you. Well, selling it's easier uh, when, when Putin is helping. Uh, so, uh, I mean, on the, you know, on a neutral, on a neutral day where, you know, there would be no war, it would be more difficult to explain, you know, why uh, having a value driven foreign policy is a way to defend your country. But now it is easier to explain that where the country that depends so much, not, not on its power of its military, but on the rules. And um, if those rules can be defended in courtrooms more than in a uh, uh, field where two armies clash, and this is, we are way more safer in, the, in this world. Um, I've talked a little bit about the corruption that, you know, that democratic countries are, are getting from uh, non-democratic. And we felt that. Uh, we started talking about uh, intrusions into our election, I would say, since 2000. Probably this was the first time when Lithuania actually experienced what it means when uh, Russia is actively participating in, um, in your election. And guess what we were called? Well, just you paranoid. You don't know how democracy works. Right. Um, maybe we didn't. I mean, we're very, very young democracy back then, just, you know, 10, 10 years or so. But in many cases, what we're seeing other countries experiencing now is the same, exactly same handbook that we've been experiencing for 20 years. And we managed to build certain levels of resilience to that. You know, we've, we have that with our laws, our, you know, how do we, want to just give you an example, how do we finance political parties? All our political parties are only financed through the, you know, government budget through, I mean, for the public budget. There's no private money. And this is how we actually stopped uh, Russian influence. So it's according to your previous result, you're getting a certain amount of money. That is it, it's not a lot of money. We're not talking, you know, tens of millions. It's quite boring campaigns actually, but uh, almost no, 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 no Russian influence. And that happened not because we were forced, but that was the way, how can we, uh, maintain that you know functioning democracy and and grow stronger being on on the border so is it is it values or is it just rationale you know because basically you can talk that this is a values-based you know electoral policy because you know we want a clean election we want you know a democracy to thrive but then again you know when you look back this is a very rational thing so now, for example, we, you know, when we started out as, as a new government after eight years in, in opposition, it's quite a long time, you know, we've written out that we would like to implement what would be called values-based foreign policy. And one of the practical ways how to do it is to build more economic ties with democratic countries. That means it's, it's trade, but you can choose who are you doing more trade with. You know, are you, you know, trading more with a, you know, law, law, international law abiding countries or not. And uh, for us, China was very helpful in this, extremely helpful. You know, they cut all the trade ties with us, absolutely, to zero. Basically, they not just cut the ties, they removed us as a country from the custom systems in retaliation for us allowing uh, to open the, the Taiwanese representative office in, in, in Vilnius. So we needed new partners. And now we have them. We compensated through the year, working more strongly with Japan, with South Korea, with, with Australia in the region, um, you know, trying you know, to find new, new markets. Uh, China's aggression has, as well helped because the, the other democratic countries wanted to trade with Lithuania more. We wanted to trade with them because you know, we needed new, 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 new possibilities. So it worked for us. You know, our, our trade with the region uh, grew, I think, eight, eight times, but with democratic countries. So. I don't think that we've we've lost. We just you know show that it is possible, it's doable, and in long term, I think it's uh, it's it will be the the strategy for how to deal with it. 
I think we had this was the next question. Oh. I'll put together two questions from the Zoom. So the first question is that next year, Lithuania hosts NATO summit. And the question is, what do you expect as Lithuania's priorities for NATO summit uh, next year? And the other question is the acknowledgement that uh, the United States, although now is supporting Ukraine actively, but there is a history of, Lithu of American isolationism policy. So how your government expects to tackle that and to convince uh, transatlantic partners to maintain steadfast support for Ukraine? Thank you. So first question is about NATO. Um, a little bit, um, just a few words to explain. Uh, thank you. Uh, when the country is uh, hosting NATO summit, we're not chairing it, we're just hosting it. <laughs> so the priorities are set uh, by, by all NATO countries. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's one thing. So even though, you know, kind of I have in my mind, uh, thank you, well, what could be called Lithuanian priorities, but they're that. They're Lithuanian priorities as a one mm, allied country, not, not Lithuanian priorities for the alliance. But then again, you have to think about this, that the, the summit will take place in Lithuania. It will take place in Vilnius. And uh, if you look at the map, Vilnius is 30 kilometers away from border with Belarus, a country that's waging war against Ukraine. What? I mean, yeah, allowing Russia to wage war against, against Ukraine in its, uh, yeah. So that's already very, uh, a very strong symbol, a very strong statement that NATO is here, you know, and at, at least 30, we're hoping that 32 uh, leaders will, will come to Vilnius. Um, there were a lot of commitments given in Madrid to, to Ukraine to support it. Uh, there were a lot of commitments made to the eastern flank, to Lithuania, you know, to bring uh, our allies, more troops to, to the region and to Lithuania. You know, we're expecting a German brigade, um, combat-ready brigade, to be uh, perm well, permanently on a rotational basis, most likely to be present in, in, in Lithuania. Other uh, Baltic states expect uh, their, their partners to do, to do the same. Um, so it will be a very good time to look back, you know, what did we manage to achieve through the year? So because the expectations in Madrid, they were raised very high. And now we have to keep up with them. And we, I think we can do that in, in Vilnius. So that's my expectation. I would believe that there will be a lot of uh, Ukrainian activity, you know, conferences and um, events, cultural events also taking place at the same time. It will be also because it's, it's quite close. Uh, you know, we have the huge uh, Ukrainian uh, um, group of people who are fled to, to Lithuania. Uh, so I think that, you know, they will speak out as well about their expectations. They will have a, a huge um, group that they can talk to. Um, the second question was? Isolation. Oh, isolation. Yes. Well, uh, yes, I, I would say that there are a lot of people who are thinking about this as a, as a dangerous path um, because... Uh, I was asked, you know, kind of to 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 uh, hypothesize, I mean, how that could look, and that it, it does not look good. I mean, it would generally create a, a vacuum in the rules-based global order, and there is no vacuum in geopolitics, so somebody will take its place. And uh, if we're talking about <clears throat> you know a certain system that's driving the world after this, and has been driving after the world after the Second World War with the UN uh, after 1949, and uh, especially after uh, the, the, the fall of Berlin Wall and of inclusiveness, including, including you know, Baltic states into, the, into this system. If that falls down and the, another system is forming, um, it, mo it could be that it won't be Western one, or it could be that it would not be proposed by any, anything uh, resembling liberal democracy. And this is a very, very dangerous uh, global system for countries like like mine. Okay, I think we had the next question, next question right here. Uh, maybe let's take a question from that side. Um, two and then three and four. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, uh, Paul Miller Malamid. Um, and first of all, thank you very much, uh, Minister Landsbergis, for being here today. 
Um, I live in Lublin, Poland, and it now seems there's more uh, Ukrainian license plates than there are Polish license plates. So I'd like to sort of zoom in on the refugee situation as a piece of this larger uh, global implications uh, issue. Uh, as you know, Poland, uh, like many other countries in the region, has a complicated and not always friendly history uh, with uh, Ukraine, and it's been incredibly inspiring to see uh, the reception of Ukrainians in, in Poland. My own stepson is working with refugees, and it's great, but I'm just wondering, uh, and also considering Poland has been kind of a recalcitrant EU member of late, uh, how you see this playing out, especially as the war is prolonged, uh, the refugee situation for the entire region. And thank you again. Well, <clears throat> I think that uh, it's still difficult to assess uh, where the situation will, um, will be at in, I don't know, half a year. Uh, when the war started, uh, Poland, the, the numbers in Poland were, you know, we we're talking about four or five million people that were in Poland. Now it's, uh, it's way down. It's, uh, we're talking about 1.7 million. So it's still enormously huge numbers, but, uh, but it, still it's, I mean, it's shifting and changing. Um, I would believe that if uh, Ukraine is continuing their successful counteroffensive, we'll see more people returning. Um, I've just came back from, from Ukraine. Last week I was in Odessa. That was my third trip to, uh, to Ukraine after the war started. And I can tell you that the mood is different. And I know that, you know, you could say, we could say, and we could agree probably that it's just the first counteroffensive. It was hugely successful, but, you know, we need to wait where there, where there is more, where they are successful. But the mood on the ground is already different. You know, people are, I went there for the first time in March 15th, I think, uh, and you can imagine, you know, how, how it looked just, you know, three weeks after the war started. And um, now it's way calmer. People are a lot more, you know, talking about the future, you know, schooling system, you know, uh, healthcare system, how to get back it to work and, and all these things. So it's normalizing. And I would, I would think that it will influence the decisions by the refugees who do not want to spend their lives in, in, um, in other countries in Europe. They will probably be, be getting back. And I think one of the things that we need to look into, uh, and that was asked practically by the, I met the mayor of Odessa, uh, I met the governor of Odessa, and they've asked to help with the uh, internally displaced people. Because we, we put so much attention to the people who are in Poland, in Lithuania, in, you know, in Czech Republic, Slovakia, wherever, but we did not provide so much help within Ukraine because we did not know where Russians will stop. But now kind of it, it's getting clearer and probably you know, it, it, it might get better. So I think it's easy to say that we can help people return to the cities who are safe. And this is, would be my, um, my suggestion to, you know, to whoever is working on, on the issue. Christina, I think there was another question here. Yeah, um, thank you, Minister, for coming out. Thank you for taking my question. My name is Dmitry Yakubov. Um, I'm a US Naval officer, so I represent that uh, NATO and questions of isolationism, et cetera. Uh, prior to coming to Yale, I actually spent quite a bit of time on the eastern flank of the alliance. I enjoyed my time, including in, <laughs> in your capital, so I don't necessarily mind. But um, uh, I do have a question with regards, and it's, it's really several uh, questions wrapped into one, but they all stem back to your admission and your opening remarks about the fact that militarily, um, the security of the Baltics runs through the NATO alliance. And when we say that, I think we all know one country contributes a bit more than than the rest of them right so to that end uh, i do want to return to the question from the gentleman over there about where do we go from here so the baltics were right and um and we have to you know the the approach of um democratization through economic engagement and how or however we want to phrase it uh didn't work so but what is next 
because I don't agree with you, or maybe that's not your point, but I don't think we can rely on isolation from, um, from autocratic regimes, uh, Russia less so than China, right? Because in the, in the grand scheme of things, we can sever ties to China, et cetera, but, but the logistic chain issues are gonna be there. When we talk about energy independence, yes, we can say no to Russian natural gas, but the rare earth metals are mined in countries that are not exactly flagships of democracy. So in the spirit of you being right uh, when it came around to saying what's not gonna work, I do wanna hear an answer as to, and maybe maybe not under this regime, I will, I will grant you that maybe for the next, uh, God willing, five to 10 years, um, this, is, this will be a, a matter of containment. But where do we go from there? Because, you know, again, to, to the point from across the room, um, isolation will just merely keep the bear in the woods. How do we, how do we transform this bear? And, and maybe also the dragon further out. Well, I think that, uh, first of all, it has to start with us transforming ourselves and actually asking what, what do we want and what, you know, what, uh, what are we prepared to pay for achieving what we want. If we want cheap gas, then that's it. That's, that's the end goal. But, and that was the end goal for you know, three decades. If we want um, cheap labor force <clears throat> for our factories, unfortunately, that's, <laughs> that was a very right strategy then that we built because we did achieve that. But while achieving that, there were certain things that were achieved along the way that did not work out quite so well. Um, so reducing reliability, just reducing the reliability on a very practical level. I understand that now with the West, and I, I mean, I, I would mostly talk about the European continent or the European Union, um, we're looking for new, uh, new contracts for gas. And yes, some of them come you know, from not the best, um, uh, the countries that do not have the best democratic standards, so to say, or human rights standards, so what, what not. And it's, it's an issue. But the problem is that you cannot affect the country through trade if you're so dependent on solely dependent on it. If you diversify, if you have, say, you know, seven, eight, 70 contracts, it's doable, you have to invest in it. So that brings you, that gives you a leverage when you say, okay, I'm sorry, you know, execution of a journalist is a, you know, a, a bad way to go when you, if you want to contract with the European Union. And luckily we have, you know, 70 other contracts that we can, you know, shift from or shift to. If you have a, one contract and that's it. And this is where we're being tested because we, you know, we're, now we're seeing, you know, they're, they're, um, different issues happening, uh, geopolitical, you know, new flare points. One of them is Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan. I would, I would, I definitely believe that this is, this is a, a test for this, you know, global system that we're talking about, because basically we're, what some actors might be thinking that we cannot keep too many balls in the air. And if you, you know, throw one more, one more, and we're done, we'll lose everything. Everybody's now focused on Ukraine, so you won't be able to handle Armenia and Azerbaijan. You might not be able to handle Serbia and Kosovo. You might not be able to handle a, a conflict somewhere else in, in, in Africa or wherever. You'll just, it's just too much. That is, that is what's, what has happened. What we can do about it, we have to, you know, European Commission promised that they will be geopolitical. We have to become geopolitical when it comes to European Union. We have to have a strategy for Georgia. We have to have a strategy for Moldova, not just Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine is obvious. We have to be active in, in Armenia and Azerbaijan, actually to use the leverage that we can in order to achieve uh, the goals that would be best suited for the, for the region. Um, we did not have, US did not have. For a very long time, US was not very active, unfortunately, in, 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 uh, in South Caucasus. Why? Because it was considered that, you know, it's, I don't know, you know, a hint of isol isolationism, but uh, it could be, it could be many reasons. Now we're seeing, you know, the activities is, is arriving, you know, we're seeing a Pelosi visit in, in Armenia, strong statements, uh, Secretary of State making calls to Baku, to Yerevan, 
almost twice a week. That did not happen a few years ago. So this is the West actually becoming or bringing back geopolitics and showing a, a political and diplomatic muscle. First of all, it is possible to strengthen the system. It is possible to show to douse the flaring points, offering uh, security and stability and, and, and solutions for the country that were there for a very long time. Um, it is possible to, um, uh, to have a strategy for, for Belarus as well, which is one of the most difficult uh, regions now currently when, when, when you think about it. But unfortunately, I believe that it will all start with victory in Ukraine. This is the first domino to fall. And then, then it opens up uh, the, the, the path to democratic Belarus. It opens path for uh, Georgia reestablishing its territorial integrity within the occupied territories. It um, most likely, I mean, if we go further from that, it uh, offers a withdrawal of Wagner forces from, from uh, African, from Sahel and everywhere else. It, you know, it all starts there. And the regime change in Russia also starts in Ukraine. I think it already started. That's a very inspiring thought. Um, I'm afraid as a timekeeper of this uh, event, our time is drawing, coming to an end. So I will um, maybe invite one more uh, very concisely worded question. Uh, I think we had, oh, okay. Uh, Anna, maybe, or I think Anna had her hair, white t-shirt right over here. Um, thank you so much. Um, now that every, now that everyone talked about diplomacy and politics, please forgive me to ask a little bit personal question. Um, you have a, a grandfather who was a leader of the independent movement from the Soviet Union. And I'm wondering how you think of your grandfather and how um, it, like, what kind of effect, like influence it has on you as a politician, as a minister of foreign affairs, or your faith as a politician? Very tough question. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I mean, uh, you know, the answer that I have prepared uh, when I started politics. <laughs> it did not change much. That, Back to your campaign. Yeah, exactly. So when I was first campaigning for the European Parliament, you know, that was the main question that everybody asked. But um, it's, it's the right one. So the, you know, the, the basic answer is I have to have my own path. And uh, that goes for every politician, no matter their family, no matter their you know, lineage, whatever. But I would not be completely honest if I would say that, you know, a person like that in your family close to you does not influence you. So, um, so there is that. Obviously you're, you know, you kind of, you're asking yourself um, or you're thinking through the time because, you know, he definitely worked through the very, very historic times. He had to stand in front of um, Soviet parliament, so to say and basically declare that Lithuania is leaving. We were the first ones to leave. And uh, there's a YouTube video about this, you know, actually him, you know, reading a text and, uh, you know, you put yourself in, in, in these shoes and you think, you know, <laughs> kind of what is he thinking then and there, you know? And, you know, the video, uh, I mean, the camera you know, zooms over to, uh, to other people listening to him and you see their faces and their iron faces nobody's smiling because basically a person out there in front of i don't know how many 500 600 people just saying look guys this show is over we're out and it's public and you cannot arrest him or anything like that and 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 there's glasnost and gorbachev uh, you know declared all those things so just one one example but it kind of it gets you thinking you know where and how would you act and, you know, kind of to do to do the right thing?